everyone, and welcome to Behind the Mic Radio. I am your host, Dawn Mack, and uh, it is Saturday. It is the weekend. The weekend's here, and uh, it's been a great day here in North Carolina. I hope it's great where you are, and I hope you've enjoyed your day. Um, I love my weekends, and I'm sure many of you do as well. There's always so much to do and, and so many fun things to do, especially now that yesterday was the official start of summer. So uh, it's on. I mean, people are doing a lot of outdoor things. People love this time of year. And uh, it's just a great time of year. So I hope so far it's uh, your summer is off to a great start. Well, our show today is is quite a treat. Our guest, um, I have such an interesting guest, and I've been looking forward to speaking with him to to talk more about what he does for his profession. And uh, definitely it's going to be of huge interest to you guys. Um, he is a video producer, a musician, a performer, and a digital storyteller. Wow. And he is his critically acclaimed multimedia show, The Road to High Street, uh, incorporates live performance, music, and storytelling um, with projected video and composite imagery. What a show. And uh, he recently has performed uh, in places like the Wilmington Fringe Festival in Delaware, Kenyon Hall in West Seattle, uh, the DeCorva Museum in Lincoln, Massachusetts, the Digital Storytelling Festival in Sedona, Arizona. Um, I mean, it just goes on and on. The Sharing the Fire Festival for the North Story- Storytelling Conference in Warwick, Rhode Island, and the AS200 in Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, he's just kind of been all over the place of late with the show. It's getting a lot of rave reviews. And uh, and he's currently now um, has a show and he's performing, and we're going to get to talk with him about that. So I would like to proudly welcome Andrew Potter. Hello. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Hi. Uh, you're so very welcome. Thank you. The honor is all ours. We are, it's, it's just... Um, it's just really a neat thing that you do, and I want to first congratulate you on the huge success of Road to High Street. Well, thank you very much. It's It's been a long time coming. I've been building this show for a long, long time, and I've kind of had to learn my way as I went. And uh, and that's just creating the material. I mean, that's just creating the, the, the video components and the musical components and getting the storyline down and then being able to execute it on stage is a whole other learning component there. And then also being able to travel with it, you know, because I have a lot of my own equipment that mm-hmm. I have to set up. So mm-hmm. there's all, and then, you know, finally, last but not least, learning how to promote it and, uh, you know, do your show uh, and attract an audience at some of these festivals I've been doing. So it's been a, it's been a long but very, very fun journey for me. I'm very happy I've gotten, I've made it this far. Oh, well, I, I think it's incredible. Um, it, you basically are a one-man show that does everything, correct? That's kind of kind of it. Uh, you know, I produced all the video myself, and I shot it all and edited it all, and, and then I project it on a large screen, and then I basically narrate live to an audience uh, some of the things that are going on in these videos. And I also accompany myself on the guitar, uh, and play music along with it. So, yeah, it is very much of a kind of electronic one-man band kind of effect. <laughs> well, now, when you first created the show or when you first came up with concept for it, I mean, did you ever envision that it would become as well-received as it has been? Well, I always felt that it was an interesting story. You know, I mean, the story is basically I spent 15 years with my buddy, my partner, a guy by the name of Wheeler Cole, and we spent 15 years uh, in San Francisco as street performers, and we had a juggling act. And, you know, we'd never been there before, so we moved out there, uh, and it took us a couple of years to kind of learn our chops, and we did. And then the thing took off, and we just started getting gigs all over the state, all over the country, all over the world, and that just kind of, you know, took off and lasted for another 10, 12 years. So I always felt that it was just a really cool story because, you know, we did all these interesting things. So I felt like I had a lot of interesting material to work with when, years later, I started to to assemble uh, this show, which is kind of our story. That's cool. So so to give the listeners a little bit of an idea about the story, um, talk a little bit about The Road to High Street and, and what it's all about. Well, it's about our journey. I mean, we called ourselves the High Street Circus. So we were a two-man juggling act 
Uh, and so that's where the title, The Road to High Street, comes from. It's kind of the journey that the High Street Circus took uh, in, in our career. And, um, you know, we started, we were undergraduates in Rhode Island, and uh, we just started performing together. In fact, we weren't even juggling back then. We were doing music and mime skits, comedy skits. And uh, we started picking up work, gigs around school, and we also started picking up summer jobs performing for a local theater company. So we started making money at this, like, real early on. And, uh, uh, you know, we both ended up with liberal arts degrees, so it's not like, you know, they were banging down our door to hire us when we got out of college. So we decided, well, what the heck, let's let's take a gamble here and see if we can make a living at this. And we had heard that San Francisco... San Francisco is a great place for street performers. So we went out there and gave it a shot. Oh, that's awesome. Now, you know, talk a little bit about some of those experiences because I can imagine if you've traveled all over the country, all over the world, and you've done so many different things with this show that was kind of a great precursor to, you know, the road to high street, um, throw out some examples of some of the things that you've kind of incorporated into the show without giving too much away, per se. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Well, one, one of the first pieces, early pieces that I do, uh, which, and it's one of my favorite pieces, because it's not, it's not like the funniest piece, and it's not really the, uh, the most sensational piece, but it's the oddest piece, the strangest piece, that I, the story that I tell. And I think that's why I like it so much. And that is that when we first moved to San Francisco, you know, we didn't have very much money, and we didn't have real jobs. We were street performers, but we didn't have real jobs. So we had a hard time finding a place to live. You know, landlords would have nothing to do with this. So we ended up, we found this guy who was renting out space in an old brewery that used to, you know, manufacture beer. And the space uh-huh. that he was rented out were these beer tanks. They were aging tanks that used to store the beer. So I have a story, a true story, called living in a beer tank because that's where we lived for the first year we were in San Francisco. We lived in this brewery, uh, in this beer tank, and it was just the strangest thing, and the strangest people were living there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we just kind of had to go with it and make it work, and uh, and we did. And I was able to take a lot of photographs of the place, so I was able to assemble those photographs uh, with, a mu- with some music and, and tell this story. And uh, I've had several people uh, who have seen the, the piece tell me that if not for the photographs, they, may, they, they wouldn't believe it because it was just too bizarre. But the fact <laughs> that I've got the, I've got the evidence right there on the big screen, you know, there it is. So. Uh, it just gives it all that you know, that's, that's amazing. I mean, because um, it, that is one of those things that, you know, if you told that story and you didn't have the footage to back it up, people would be looking at you like, really? Are you pulling my leg kind of thing, as we right. say in the South? Right, right. It would be unbelievable, you know. Um, but, gosh, I mean, uh, I don't know that it gets any more interesting than living in something like that. <laughs> all the tales, you know. Interesting is a is a nice way to describe it. That's very good. Yes, it was interesting. <laughs> well, nonetheless, you know, who knew that that would end up being great material for your show, and um, and I'm sure it, it's uh, good for a lot of laughs as well. Um, I imagine the way you tell that is is quite amusing, and um, it, it's one of those things that you, it's not something you're going to see every day or hear about every day, you know, and, right, uh, and right, so it's right. quite intriguing and interesting all the same time. Um, So one of the terms that I've been hearing a lot um, associated with your show is the word busker. And uh, and for those listeners of ours who may not know what a busker is, can you share with us what this is exactly? Yeah, a busker is is basically a street performer, uh, someone who Mm -hmm. performs uh, outdoors in a public or private mall um, it does not get paid by the administration and passes the hat for his income. So uh, a busker uh-huh. is someone who, who, do, who does a show and passes their hat. Now, it kind of covers a pretty wide range of, of performers because anybody, and you've probably seen plenty of people 
you know, out on the sidewalk playing the guitar with a guitar case open, you know, so they're buskers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, but yeah. But also yeah. There, are, there are places in the country and around the world um, that attract, you know, top quality acts, stage acts that are street performers. They, they, don't, they don't get paid. They pass their hat. But they uh-huh. also do like a 30-minute stage show or a 40-minute stage show. And uh, uh, so it's top-notch entertainment. You know, it's as good as anything you'll see anywhere. Uh, it just happens to be out on the street, and they pass the hat for a living. And uh, there's a whole community of performers that, that do this. And, uh, uh, you know, if they're lucky like we were, you know, we were in an area where we could make our living right where we were. You know, there was plenty of stage uh-huh. time uh, in San Francisco at the time. And so we were able to crank out, you know, we had four or five days of work a week doing three, four, five, six shows a day, 30-minute um, shows. So that's that's a lot of work. Um, oh, yeah. So we didn't have to travel. Uh, but there are other performers who like travel, and they'll go to different towns that have uh, spots for busking, and they'll go to Europe. And, uh, uh, you know, there's opportunities all over. And uh, we didn't opt to do travel as buskers, most of our traveling was because people would see us in San Francisco, uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. And we'd hand out cards, and they'd call us up, and they'd hire us. So that's how we did wow. all our traveling. We didn't, we didn't go as buskers. We went as, uh, 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 you know, performers that were, were paid. Yeah. Well, that's so neat. I mean, because think about all the people. I mean, just in my, as you're telling that story, it, um, and you're giving everyone an idea of what a busker is. I mean, I'm thinking in my lifetime, the number of times I've seen someone performing outside on the street, um, you know, or in a local mall as an individual, or you know, just in any number of places. And um, and you know, to me, it seems like it would be a very, very hard way to make a living uh, and a good living. But it sounds like you and your partner definitely really lucked out in terms of, of being able to not only make a living, but, you know, get people to call you, to hire you, to, to go to wherever to perform your show, which is just awesome. Yeah, yeah, and, it, it you know, it, it if you have the opportunity and you get good enough, you know, you can make very good money at it because, you know, you're in a public place. I mean, the, the key thing is having crowds around. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're in, if you're in a place where there's people milling about and they'll come see a show, you know it's pretty easy for them to watch and enjoy a show because they're already there. And when you think about it, you know most buskers they pass the hat, they mostly get one dollar bills. But if you get a crowd of three hundred people, um, mm-hmm. you know you, you can make three hundred dollars. And if you can crank that out three or four times a day. You know, you, you can you can make oh, yeah. some pretty decent cash, cash. You know, yeah. especially especially for us who are a couple of twenty something you know guys just out of college who were you know found ourselves making our living at this you know from day one. So it was it was pretty exciting. That is cool. That is that's really cool. I mean, it's kind of like your story can serve to be kind of inspiring for a lot of people, not only who who want to get into who, you know, are maybe natural born entertainers or they do some of this stuff and they're trying to figure out what in the world do they need to do or how do they go about it. And um, and as you have done this throughout your career, I mean, what do you find to be or what have you found to be the most challenging aspect of it? Um, uh, has there been any? I mean, it sounds like you've, you've had a lot of fortune along the way. The challenging aspect of, of street performing? Yeah, I mean, just any any aspect of it from, you know, trying to get out there and make it. And, and uh, because I'm sure there are some listeners who maybe are really interested in this sort of thing, but just really right. maybe are at a loss for how to go about getting out there and, and getting their name out there and, and what they're doing. Right. Well, you know, like a lot of things, the way to do it is you just do it. Um, you know, mm-hmm. you have to live, live in an area where it's allowed and there's opportunities uh, to do it. And then, like anything else, you know, it takes a while to learn your craft, so you have to suffer through the first however many years it is before you start to get the hang of it. And, you know, for us, even though we were making our living at it, you know, we were living in a beer tank, so we didn't have much to drink, (laughs) Bill. So that's really how we were able to get by. I mean, we were making money when we started, but we weren't very good, so we weren't making much money. 
but we were making enough to get by. And then it, so it took us it took us two years, uh, two years of cranking out shows before we uh, we we got tight. And uh, and so you know you have to be in a position you know both mentally and and physically I guess uh, to be able to endure that. So that's that's one of the biggest challenges when you start is just to be able to you know get through it until you uh, are, are able to make a to make it really work. Oh yeah, and and just staying the course, you know, and the determination factor has to come into play, and lots of discipline because you know that you know as as lucrative as it can end up being, it is really something that you can't give up on too easily. You have to really work at it if you want to be successful as as you were and have been. And uh, so I'm sure you have inspired many people out there um, who are interested in doing this sort of thing. Um, but as with anything, you know, it's not easy, but at least um, it gives it gives people an idea of, of how to go about it and what to do. Um, now, I know currently you are performing as of, I guess, tomorrow. You played some dates already at the Hollywood Fringe Festival out in Los Angeles. Talk a little bit about that. Well, it's, it's been a really fun run. So I've been doing Fringe Festivals, uh, uh, just a couple of them a year, for about two years. And uh, uh, they're really a lot of fun because, you know, my show, it's so unique that, especially when I'm I'm still relatively unknown, um, you know, it's difficult to plug into existing venues. Um, But in in a fringe festival, you know, fringe is like the fringes of mainstream theater. That's where the name comes Uh from. So all kinds of stuff that's just totally off the wall. Um, so that's what's really fun about it is because I, I fit in because, you know, everybody's doing, you know, all kinds of interesting work. So uh, it fits into the fringe concept very, very well. And uh, so I decided to do Hollywood um, because I uh, I have to uh, drive to my gigs because I have a fair amount of equipment. You know, I've got a laptop mm-hmm. and I've got a small sound system and I've got a video projector and a screen and all that stuff. Um, and I'm able to drive uh, from San Francisco. I lived so long in San Francisco, but I still have a lot of resources there. Um, uh-huh. So I would drive down to L.A. from San Francisco. And also, the other thing that drew me to Hollywood was, was that it's Hollywood. You know, you, you're going to put yourself up against <clears throat> some of the best talent in the country. <clears throat> so why not give it a shot and sort of see where you land, you know, how, how well you stack up. Uh, so that's always... Uh, uh, you know, a good, a good, uh, a good measure. You know, sort of see mm-hmm. how you Most definitely. Well, and as people come out and as people come out and see your show, um, what is something that you would want people to um, take away from from seeing it? I think you know, I I try and make it uh, inspirational because it you know the drive that I put into this has served me very well. Um, the other thing that I do a little bit of talking about in the show is I talk about, you know, how what you know when you, when you take off on a unconventional career like this, you know, there are repercussions. There are repercussions with taking such a risk. There are repercussions with what your friends and your family are going to think. Um, so I have a section of my show where I talk about what it was like, basically telling my father, Dad, you know, I'm going to. I'm going to California to become a street performer and a juggler. Well, how is he supposed to take that, right? So, uh, uh, so I, I, I talk about that and how you kind of, you know, you have to reconcile, um, you know, your beliefs with other parts of society. And there's plenty of people who don't know anything about street performing who literally think that I'm just kind of some guy strumming the guitar on the side of the road. And they don't necessarily think very highly of that. Uh, but, you know, when they find out, if they find out, it's like, no, no, there's actually some very, very high-quality talent that are street performers, and they can make a good living at it. Um, well, you know, it might change their, their opinion a little bit, but most people don't really recognize that aspect of it. Well, I think I think um, if there's any kind of stigma attached at all, it's only because it's just an element of entertainment that has not been, you know, put on television or put in front and center in front of, you know, society to see it for what it is. I mean, to me, it would be no different than acting or, you know, being a magician or being a singer. I mean, 
because in your show there's an element of all of that in to some degree. Um, you know, yes, what you yeah. need to do is get someone to make a reality show of what you do, and uh, and then the whole world will know what this is. Um, and, you know, and I don't say that in jest. I mean, in truth, I think a lot of it is just the fact that it's kind of one of these these things that most people are not familiar with or, or don't aren't. You know, they don't really understand it because it's not front and center. And you know, like right, most everything right. else is. Um, right. And I think it's just a matter of, of gaining the exposure for what it what it is. You know. Right. Which yeah. would be and awesome. I'll t- tell you another thing that that is also one of the big draws for the people who are in the field of street performing, is you know, is the um, uh, what's the word, um, you know, the freedom. And mm-hmm. uh, the independence, autonomy, that's the word, the autonomy of being mm-hmm. you know, your own boss and running your own gig and not having producers to deal with, not having agents to deal with, uh, not having to, you know, all these middlemen to deal with. Um, you know, you just get to do your thing the way you want to do it. Mm-hmm. And, and that autonomy, aut- autonomy is one of the things that a lot of people really like about the business and they stay in it for that reason and uh, the other thing is is being in an outdoor environment you know you get a nice crowd and you get them up close enough in, in the proper spot and it become a very very intimate performance especially if mm-hmm. the performer knows his stuff and it can be some of the most thrilling and, and intimate theater that you'll see anywhere uh, and uh, but it doesn't have huge overhead and it, it doesn't have all these constraints that sometimes you find uh, uh, indoors. But uh, mm-hmm. so, That's so, right. Yeah, and, you know, I just, I just know in times in my life when I've seen, you know, this sort of thing growing up and throughout, you know, all it takes is for a few people to start clustering around the performer to where mm. people can't see the performer necessarily, but they get curious and they venture over, you know, oh, what's going on over there? You know, like if you're in a mall. Right. Like when I was growing up, there was a man, and I don't know if he lived in my area or if he was just someone that kind of passed through periodically, but he always had a monkey. And he brought the monkey to the mall, and how he got in the mall with an animal, I don't know, but he did. And people would, you know, toss the monkey quarters. And uh, this was about 25 years ago. And, um, and so... It just drew a crowd. And then it got to be kind of a regular thing where people would go to the mall just to see if the monkey was going to be there. So, you know, it it is interesting how, you know, a crowd will draw a crowd. And the bigger the crowd, right. the more people come. And and um, and like you say, if, if a performer is very good at what they do, you're going to draw a crowd without a doubt, you know, um, and and hold a crowd there. Um, which is really, like you say, a very intimate thing. It's not like performing in front of a, you know, a mass crowd of 3,000 people in a theater or even a coliseum. You know, it's just smaller scale, but it it can be very magical in that way. Yeah, yeah, and that, that small scale really is the thing that makes it so intimate. I mean, we've done shows, you know, three, four, 500 people, you know, all packed in tight, and that can be a pretty intimate uh, show, you get much more than that, you know. I mean, we've done shows in theaters for, for like a thousand people, um, and you know, if you can't see past the first row, and you can't when yeah. you're on stage under the yeah. lights, you know, it's kind of hard to reach out. So uh, you kind of, you know, just deal with the people in the front row and kind of hope that it that it reaches the back row. But uh, but yeah, outdoors it worked very very well. What is um what is one aspect of your show that you just absolutely love performing for the crowd? Um, it, well, it would be, it would have to be the same thing that I enjoyed about street performing so much, which which was talking to an audience and um, trying to get a dialogue going. Um, that's a little more difficult for me now because in a theater, and especially at a theater festival, and especially in Hollywood, where most people are doing plays, uh, you know, fourth wall plays, where they, they, they're they pretending there's nobody there, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, and so that can be kind of tricky, but but they're not necessarily used to me addressing them as a performer. And so I, ha- I haven't had it much luck in getting people to address me back. But, you know, reaching oh. out and connecting with people that are in front of you, 
um, is the thing that I enjoy the most about it, trying to reach out personally and, and connect with folks. So that's why a small venue is kind of nice. Um, where are, you know, after you finish up the Hollywood Fringe Festival, where will you be headed next? Have you got some performances forthcoming through the summer months? Uh, well, I'm based in on the East Coast in Rhode Island, and uh-huh. uh, Providence, Rhode Island, has a pretty decent uh, art scene happening. Um, I've only been there. I grew up there, but I've been away for 30 years, and I've only been back for a couple. So I'm starting to make inroads uh, around there in some various art venues and clubs. And I, I've done a few shows uh, a couple months ago. I did several shows uh, in some new venues for me. And I'll sort of pick up where I left off uh, when I get back from this trip and uh, uh, kind of make some more inroads in the in the Providence and the New England and the East Coast uh, performing scene. Awesome. Well, this sounds like a great show. I hope that if you're ever in the Carolina area, North Carolina, South Carolina region, that um, you will let me know because I would love to get out to see this. It, it's just—it's not something we see every day here, you know, in the Carolinas. And I know I can almost bank on the fact that I don't know of a soul that's ever performed and, and has a story about a beer keg to tell. So, you know, <laughs> that would be—that would be worth it just to see that and hear all about that. So. So I just I, I wish you the best of much continued success with the show. It, it sounds like it's just gotten some really great reviews so far, and is is really making some waves out there. And, and congratulations to you on that. And uh, we wish you the very best. Well, thank you very much. I've uh, I've enjoyed myself very much out here in Hollywood, and uh, I got three more shows to go. My my next show is tomorrow afternoon, two thirty p.m. Uh, at the Theater Asylum Lab in Hollywood. Um, and then next weekend I've got two more. So uh, I'm looking forward to building my audience through the week and and, uh, hopefully getting some good crowds. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much for your time today and sharing what you do with us. It sounds like a load of fun for an audience to see. And, uh, again, as I said, we wish you much continued success with it and beyond. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. The show is The Road to High Street. The artist is Andrew Potter, and uh, he can currently be seen at the Hollywood Fringe Festival in Los Angeles, California. He's performing at the Theater Asylum in the Asylum Lab at 1078 Lillian Way, and he has a show tomorrow afternoon at 2.30 p.m., so if you're in the L.A. area, be sure to... um, Get out and see him. If you want to visit him on the web, you can find him at theroadtohighstreet.com. And uh, you can also find him on Twitter at Road to High Street and AP4TV uh, Twitter, either one. And um, sounds like a very, very interesting show indeed and uh, definitely one that would be would bear watching for sure. So if you're a big fan of buskers and street performers, uh, then this show definitely is for you. And uh, that is actually going to wrap our show for today. And let's see what we have on tap. Um, Monday, coming Monday, we have a female artist. She is a singer-songwriter, but she's also a stunt woman. Um, she has done some acting and uh, is, is an artist. And, and I've listened to her music. It's really, really good. And so we're going to be speaking with her. Her name is Deja May, and she will be here at 7 p.m. Eastern on Monday evening. And uh, and so we hope that you will be here for that. And so with that, I will say good night. And oh, and before I let you go, I wanted to announce. Um, this is kind of an afterthought, folks. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, I have added a new radio show to our family of radio shows. Yes, we are expanding yet again. And uh, and it premieres tonight. The name of the radio show is Beach Party Radio. And it is a show that features some music and interviews of Carolina Beach music artists. Now, if you're in the South like I am uh, and you frequent the beaches uh, along North and South Carolina, then you are very familiar with beach music and you know what that is. But for those of you who live outside of that area and may not be as familiar or may not have heard of it, um, it is just a genre of music and it's very fun, upbeat, feel-good kind of music. And there are tons of artists in my region that 
uh, have gone out and they're making a living at this music and they're performing at festivals all over the place. They're performing clubs. Um, and one of the biggest hot spots on the East Coast in North and South Carolina called uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Many of you may be familiar with that. Um, but they work the circuit down there, and they are in high demand in our area. So we have started the show uh, in dedication to those guys. We're going to be doing some interviews with some of the beach music artists. And tonight we will be premiering our show. And we will be also premiering our music show, which is called Beach Party Blast. And it will be every other Saturday night at 7 p.m. Uh, because we'll be alternating that with our Indie Artist Showcase um, on Saturday night. So tonight, if you want to find out what beach music is all about, tune in 7 p.m. on Beach Party Radio right here on blogtalkradio.com, and, uh, and we'll be glad to introduce you to this great style of music. All right, guys, that is going to wrap our show for this evening. Thank you so very much for being with us. We want to thank our special guest, Andrew Potter, for being with us as well. If you're brand new at our program, welcome aboard. We're always glad to welcome in new listeners, and we thank you. So enjoy your evening and enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we'll see you right back here Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern with Deja May. Good night, all. Thanks for listening to tonight's show. You can connect to Behind the Mic Radio on Twitter at BT Mike Radio and on Facebook at Behind the Mic Radio. Check out our website at BehindTheMicRadio.com. Also, follow us right here on Blog Talk Radio where you can stay up to date on all upcoming shows. Every episode is available for immediate download upon the conclusion of each broadcast and as always on iTunes. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>